The, um, what I'm going to be talking to you about is stereotactic radio surgery. And um, stereotactic radio surgery is a very interesting, less invasive modality of delivering radiation treatment and therapy uh, to patients who require some type of radiation dosing. Um, it, and I'll, I'll go through the different devices and kind of give you some ideas to how it's technically performed because that's somewhat interesting for a lot of us. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll review some of the more common uh, and contemporary utilizations uh, of this uh, in neurosurgery. Um, SRS is what is uh, um, often called, or stereotactic radio surgery, has multiple different uh, applications. Um, you can use it uh, in the brain, and we'll talk obviously a lot about brain and spinal applications. Um, ear, nose, and throat doctors will use it for skull-based types of uh, lesions that are outside the brain. Uh, obviously, in the head and neck, we'll use it. Uh, stereotactic radio surgery of the spine uh, is also very, very commonly used, typically for tumors, of course. Uh, and then lesions in the liver, lung, the prostate, and other urological issues uh, can can also be used. One of the things you can't use it on are, are, are more typically moving organs. We're actually getting better, though, with even localizing um, uh, 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 lesions in the lung and things like that, where it actually you have to take into account real-time movement of that to deliver a radiation dose. Let's talk for a moment, though, about a, a common use of this, and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll break out uh, from that use and talk about the actual um, uh, process itself. Trigeminal neuralgia is uh, a common disorder uh, for us, but an uncommon one for the rest of us. Um, it's common for neurosurgeons to treat because uh, typically it's a very obvious and painful disorder. Um, it's, it's interesting, historically, fragile neuralgia is one of the two things that if you read through Egyptian hieroglyphic, 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 um, and, and, and understand uh, the kinds of conditions they were treating, um, status epilepticus and trigeminal neuralgia are the two that you can actually tease out historically. And so those are the two uh, disorders that were really first described historically. Um, it's typically described as a very intense pain, uh, usually on one side of the face, um, and typically in a typical distribution. Classically, these patients will have triggers that will cause these um, uh, uh, painful attacks to occur. It can occur once a year or several times per day. Um, and it's really described as a sharp knife-like um, uh, pain. Often, patients will show up and they'll have, they'll have a masked face, for example, because they, they don't want to smile, they don't want to risk triggering that, or they'll be extremely uh, emaciated because they, they can't eat, because they can't chew, because they, they, they have this inability to, to, to uh, uh, do these things because they're, they're guarding. They don't want to cause these attacks to occur from these triggers. Um, it's caused by hypersensitivity of the fifth cranial nerve, or the trigeminal nerve. And that's more common in women and men. Um, and uh, it's more frequent as we get older. Um, typically, the mainstay of treatment for trigeminal neuralgia is medical. Um, and typically, that will include one or a number of different medications, classically Tegretol or, um, or some type of other anti-seizure medication, because it's really thought, as I said a moment ago, to be a hypersensitivity of that nerve. Um, when those medical treatments fail, and often they will fail only because patients become more refractory to this. For example, they'll have an episode of trigeminal neuralgia and be diagnosed appropriately with this. They'll begin their medication regime for this, um, sometimes one or multiple different medications, but then over the course of months or more typically years, these patients will uh, become refractory to what used to work before. And that's a fairly typical um, pattern associated with trigeminal neuralgia. When those fail, then really these patients still have horrible pain, and that's when we then see them in our clinic. And there's basically two different types of modalities of treatment of trigeminal neuralgia, and we'll get back to SRS here in a moment. Uh, surgical treatment and radiosurgical treatment. Uh, surgical treatment um, is typically either uh, percutaneous, meaning placing a small needle up in through the cheek and going into the base of the skull, um, usually under x-ray uh, guidance, and then what we'll do is we'll inject one or a number of different types of things into that nerve to help deaden that nerve. The advantage of using those percutaneous techniques is that it's very less invasive. The disadvantage is that it doesn't really work very long, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. Uh, much more commonly used uh, is actually surgery for this, where we make a small incision behind the ear and go in and physically decompress that nerve, take away the irritation from the small blood vessel that's typically pressing on that nerve um, that's causing the problem. 
If those don't work and there are some other uh, surgical modalities listed there, um, then we can turn to radiosurgical techniques. Radiosurgical techniques um, are, are very popular because they're less invasive. Um, and we'll talk about some results of that in just a moment. Um, there are many different treatment algorithms that we have used over the course of the years, um, and uh, typically we'll look at, uh, obviously, any type of patient who's going to undergo a more invasive uh, treatment than uh, medication will have a couple of different options. The percutaneous techniques that I talked about, um, but then as we look down on the bottom, do we have a laser pointer? Um, but then as we work through some of these other, uh, some of these other modalities, uh, age is typically a big factor in, in looking at those patients who will respond versus uh, to either surgical, uh, which is the microvascular decompression that I spoke of, with just a moment about. And that's typically fairly effective. But even if that fails in our typical treatment modality, and this is, if you will, the most common treatment modality other than medication that we use, this upper tier here, but even if that recurs, um, which sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, uh, then these candidates are serotonic radio surgery. But if you look at the remainder of the uh, treatment modalities, SRS, SRS, SRS is typically a commonly used one. Modality. So let's talk a little bit more about SRS or stereotactic radio surgery and understand a little bit more about what it, this is um, and how it's really used. There are three typical brands of Kleenex, as I like to call. In other words, three different modalities of stereotactic radio surgery. They're all very similar in terms of the ultimate principle, which is delivering a dose of radiation, a, a dot of radiation, if you will, to a specific part of the brain. There's gamma knife radio surgery, linac based radio surgery, and cyber knife radio surgery. And I'll have, all of them have their advantages and disadvantages. As I said a moment ago, the, the, the focus beam of radiation is really the key to the, the key modality here. And no matter how that's delivered, and we'll go through the different modalities here in a second as a point of education, the, the key thing here is that it delivers this dot of radiation to a part in the body, but it limits the radiation to the rest of the structures around this. Well, how is this done? Well, classically, probably the best description is with gamma knife. This was actually the first radiosurgical device out there, um, developed in Sweden in 1951. Currently, they use a cobalt radiation source. And what happens is the target is here. So the tumor, the nerve, whatever you're trying to target is here. The radiation source in the gamma knife radiosurgery lies on the outside in this in uh, on the outside of this metallic container here and through this metallic container there are all these little holes that are very specifically oriented so that if you shine a laser beam or in this case a radiation source through there they all coalesce to form here the advantage here is that there are 201 holes in a dome uh, of the uh, uh, of the gamma knife uh, radio surgery device um, but at the end of the day they all focus and coalesce here. The advantage of doing that, though, is that if you have a structure here, or here, or here, it's only getting one or perhaps two of these radiation beams rather than all of these intense beams. Um, and we can even block out or, or what we call plug multiple holes so that we can even have paths uh, that will select out, and we'll talk a little bit about how we target these in a moment. Um, we have paths that we can eliminate radiation from. It works very well, and as a result, you have a high-intensity focus beam of radiation here, in, in this case, for example, here right in the middle of this patient's head where we're going in for this particular uh, procedure, but everywhere else is getting a relatively low dose. Radiation's nice because if you don't have a high dose, you and I tolerate it pretty well. If we fly between New York and LA, we get the equivalent of several doses of radiation that's equivalent to a chest x-ray. So a lot of us, all of us, are exposed to radiation on a daily basis. Um, it's just limiting the amount of radiation. So if we can limit the amount of radiation to a particular uh, area in the head, for example, here, 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 or here, then patients tolerate it pretty well. So that's gamma knife. And gamma knife is, is, um, is, a, is a, uh, the advantages of gamma knife are, are fairly clear from a radiation source standpoint. It's a very stable source of radiation. Um, this, the radiation source that's inside this machine lasts for about 10 years. And so over the course of 10 years, there's a constant um, uh, decrease of the amount of radiation that's used. And so the procedures take longer and longer and longer. 
The, but it is a very precise dosing. The disadvantage of gamma knife, as we'll talk about, is that there's a frame that has to be placed on the patient. And so patients are walking around the hospital uh, during the day of the procedure with this, with this frame on. And for a lot of patients, um, that's, that's a real significant discomfort. The other issue with, with gamma knife is that if you have any is uh, issues with claustrophobia, um, you, as you can see there, it can be a real, a real problem. Lenin based radio surgery is the second type of radiation. Uh, serotonin radio, radio surgery. And basically what happens is that there's a linear accelerator in this machine here. And what happens is that this machine rotates about an axis. And so as a result, you get, as you see here, we call these individual shots. Um, so a shot is done and then the radiation port is closed and then it moves over three degrees, for example. And then another shot is over here, another shot is over here, another shot is over here, another shot is over here. And as a result, you have this, these fan belts, if you will, of different uh, radiation doses so that, again, limiting the amount of an individual trajectory but ultimately focusing on the same trajectory. This is a very well accepted uh, uh, utilization of stereotactic radio surgery. Um, there is typically more of a, uh, a frame-based type of situation. It is image-guided. Um, and really what we'd like to think about is, is, is arc-based radiotherapy. The disadvantage is only one, and that is that you're limited by basically the arcing here, so that if you've got sensitive structures that are within a given arc, you either don't utilize that arc uh, and or have to go ahead and radiate through that. Um, the advantage of cyberknife radio surgery um, is that uh, instead of being limited to arcs, you have a linear accelerator mounted on the end of a robotic arm here, and as a result, you can have an infinite number of shots. You're not limited by the arc. And so this is really the most contemporary um, type of stereotactic radio surgery. Uh, there's no fixed frame. Obviously, all these are image guided. This robotic arm is the exact same robotic arm that you see in the auto industry. It's got sub, sub millimetric precision, um, and literally it, it arrives uh, at the at the at the factory in a crate, and it's orange, just like you see in the in the TV commercials. And they paint it white, and they obviously calibrate it and mount the uh, and mount the arm on there. Um, and there aren't any real disadvantages uh, of, of using this system, and it adds significantly to the flexibility. So getting back to our, our utilization of stereotactic radio surgery, in this case for trigeminal neuralgia, um, in the CyberKnife uh, setting, we, the only thing one does is you have a mask that's fit. It's this mesh mask that's kind of a rigid mask. Uh, typically, they have a CT scan of the brain as well as an MRI of the brain. These two then are, are meshed together. And the advantage of meshing these together is that MRI, as you may or may not know, has a small amount of artifact, especially when it works around the bone. And so as a result, that artifact uh, can indeed cause problems. CT scans uh, don't have as good a resolution, but they don't have that artifact. So we blend these two together uh, to create a plan. And indeed, that's what we see here. It's a, it, this is a CT scan, and the trigeminal nerve lives right in that general zip code there. And then what we do is we blend these together. Here's the MRI here. Here's a CT scan here. We coalesce these together, and then in multiple different views, look at and try to identify the trigeminal nerve. Uh, once that trigeminal nerve is identified, uh, then through a series of planning steps, we go ahead and, and clearly mark the trigeminal nerve, which is this nerve right here, and, uh, and mark and then create a, a, a treatment plan associated with that. The other thing we do with our treatment plans here is that we carefully highlight the other areas of, of importance. For example, here, the brainstem is something that we want to limit the dosing to. Uh, and then once we create a plan here, um, and this doesn't project very well, um, but we basically identify uh, the hot spot where we want to have all of our intense radiation and minimize the low spot here, which is the brainstem. So for example, if we had a radiation source here on a gamma knife radio surgery, it would go through the brainstem and radiate the brainstem. Well, with uh, CyberKnife, we just have all of our shots, for example, coming from this side of this patient in this example and limit the dosing of the radiation. Obviously, radiation will still go through, but you can certainly minimize, uh, to some extent, the dosing of the radiation. We've got fairly uh, sophisticated computer algorithms that can limit that. So um, what do we do for tri uh, trigeminal neuralgia with CyberKnife? Uh, we typically dose uh, about 70 to 90 gray, which is a lot of radiation, but it's on a very specific part, that little part right here. And so if we can do a lot of radiation to that part and minimize radiation to the other parts, uh, then typically we'll have some success. 
we limit the uh, uh, brainstem radiation to the 20% isodose line, which means that less than 20% of the radiation ever gets to the brainstem, and we also are very protective of the optic nerves. We've shown that with um, the length of the nerve, the, um, uh, we, we have better pain control with longer treatment lengths in terms of the nerve, um, but unfortunately the longer length we treat, the higher facial numbness there is. There's always a, there's always a pros and their, their cons associated with this. What kinds of success how do we have with the percutaneous uh, modalities here, which is the, versus the microvascular surgical decompression here versus the cyber knife? Well, these are all complications associated with this. And what we can see going through here, and this is with gamma knife, by the way, not with cyber knife, but stereotactic grade surgery is typically lumped together when we look at these kinds of things, um, is that really other than, uh, other than uh, the uh, sensory problems that we can sometimes see with uh, percutaneous issues, all of these have a fairly low risk profile, which is certainly good. So then what else do we want them to do? Well, if they've all got fairly low risk profiles, with the exception of some increased uh, sensory abnormalities with a percutaneous thing, um, how well do they work? Well, um, a lot of folks have talked about this, and basically, um, their, uh, their microvascular decompression, which is the surgical uh, procedure that we talked about, versus the gamma knife, again, the stereotype brain surgery, um, have, have fairly similar efficacy. The difference is with the surgical approach, we actually have a longer duration of pain control. Uh, ablative procedures, which are the percutaneous techniques, um, about half the patients are still uh, pain free at four years, but those patients who had this trigeminal neuralgia are very fearful of the return of pain. And so that's not something that typically is a good uh, uh, point of discussion for patients. If you say, well, you know, there's about a 50% chance that in a couple of years this will come back. Patients aren't really too excited about doing that. Um, the average pain-free outcome at, uh, for, for stereotype rate surgery is about three years. Microvascular decompression, 70% of patients in 10 years uh, still have uh, a pain-free outcome. And so typically speaking, if a patient can tolerate the microvascular surgical decompression, that's what we'll do. It's not because we're surgeons, because it's the, the research has shown uh, that this has the longest efficacy. Um, the, uh, and then typically, if, uh, if that fails, then we'll go ahead and do the cybernetic radio surgery, as you saw in our algorithm before. Um, certainly, depending on who's reporting this and what the clinical outcomes are, you'll have, you'll have varying uh, senses of results from uh, gamma knife radio surgery, LINAC, which is that second arc based thing, versus cyber knife. But they're all fairly efficacious, and I think that's kind of the take home point here. Um, but some are, some are more than others. And um, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, uh, it's really important when we're talking to patients so that they really understand what are, what are the pros and cons here of uh, doing the different types of approaches. Let's talk a little bit about intracranial tumors because intracranial tumors are another common utilization of stereotactic radio surgery. Um, uh, uh, intracranial tumors are typically broken up into a number of different things. Secondary uh, carcinomas, uh, which means basically metastatic disease gliomas, which are primary tumors in the brain, meningiomas, which are primary benign tumors in the brain, and then a slurry of other types of things that are much less common. Uh, current indications for um, treatment uh, of, with stereotactic brain surgery in the brain, well, there's a whole list here of benign tumors that cause problems in the brain that we often will have to deal with. Acoustic neuromas, meningiomas, um, pituitary problems here. Malignant tumors, though, really are the more important utilization of um, uh, of stereotactic radio surgery because this is where we can really affect um, some, some positive uh, treatment. Um, uh, it can be used as a primary treatment modality, more typically, as we'll see in a second, uh, it's a primary, uh, uh, it's, it's done with uh, other surgical types of things. We can all also boost uh, the radiation, uh, excuse me, we can also boost the surgical bed when we take the tumors out, and occasionally we can use it for salvage. Uh, metastasis uh, is something that uh, is also commonly used for stereotactic radio surgery. But stereotactic radio surgery isn't everything. There are clearly some limitations. Um, tumors typically have to be less than three, three centimeters in size. If they're larger than that, typically stereotactic radio surgery doesn't work because we have to spread out the dose too much, and as a result, we just get ineffective dosing. Um, the extent of intracranial disease, if there are multiple intracranial lesions, as we sometimes will see, um, then obviously you can't, you can't do high intensity dosing on every single lesion, and therefore as a result, um, uh, uh, we have some limitations there. Typically it's five or less lesions we can use stereotactic radio surgery. Um, and then obviously the extent of it, systemic disease. This is a, an ethical question as much as anything. We're not going to treat uh, aggressively somebody who's got 
diffuse metastatic disease if we think the prognosis is indeed not great. Um, anatomic uh, location of the tumor. Sometimes, honestly, um, there, there are other problems that we have, to, we have to indeed employ surgical methods. If there's symptomatic compression, which is a common um, uh, a problem, you know, the, the brain tumor is just too big, it's causing too much pressure, well, radiosurgery is not going to fix that. Um, if there's a presence of hydrocephalus in the brain, which is an excessive spinal fluid in the brain. Um, so I think the take, take on here is multiple modalities are really required uh, when we're evaluating patients with intracranial uh, disease. What's the difference between radiosurgery, which is what we're talking about this morning, and radiotherapy? A lot of us have heard of radiotherapy. Well, there's, there's a couple of key differences. Uh, radiosurgery, or stereotactic radiosurgery, um, uses a high dose and typically is one or sometimes a couple of fractions, but it's a very high intense dose as we saw in those pictures earlier. Radiotherapy is what's more commonly used um, for uh, treatment of, of metastatic disease in other parts of the body. And it's a lower dose and with multiple fractions. So if you hear us, we use the radiation therapy for a month and a half. These are the types of things uh, that uh, in, uh, can, can in fact be used. So, uh, so, so, there's, so there's, a clear, there's a clear difference um, between uh, between the uh, uh, between radiosurgery and radiotherapy. Radiosurgery is what we're talking about this morning. And at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is basically burn the heck out of the tumor with, with radiosurgery. Whereas radiotherapy, we're really trying to get uh, tumor control, but it's not intense enough typically to kill the tumor. Metastasis. Um, well, metastasis is something that unfortunately we deal a lot with. Um, and um, it's a fairly common um, uh, problem that we have as neurosurgeons. Um, a huge number of metastases are identified every year, and unfortunately, multiple, a, a lot of these could be multiple. It typically won't just be one metastasis. Why is that? Well, often when uh, a, metastatic cell, a, a metastatic cell gets to the blood-brain barrier, which is a protective barrier, barrier around the brain, there's little that our own immunologic system can do to help combat that. And as a result, typically when you see one, there's almost always more than one metastatic lesion in the brain. That's different than if you compare that, for example, with lung cancer. Um, fortunately, uh, the stereotactic radio surgery is something that we can employ with this. Um, and again, the target population for stereotactic radio surgery are smaller lesions. Um, that, uh, that have minimal mass effect, but indeed we want to get control of these lesions. Why? Because we want to get control of the overall systemic disease. Um, there are a couple of studies uh, that look at uh, stereotactic radio surgery in addition to whole brain versus whole brain, uh, whole, whole brain radiation alone. Now, whole brain uh, radiotherapy alone is more of a, of, a, of a kind of a standard way of dealing with metastatic disease. Why? Well, as I said a moment ago, typically speaking, when we see one metastatic lesion in the brain, we see more than one metastatic lesion in the brain. And as a result, the, 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 the old standby, well, let's, well, let's just radiate the whole brain. Let's try to get control of even the ones we can't see yet before they even grow. Well, uh, there are a couple of different studies that have, that have looked at this, um, and a couple of decent uh, uh, level one, level two evidence, basically that said that um, uh, single dose radiosurgery along with whole brain leads to better overall outcome as compared to whole brain radiotherapy alone. For patients who have a pretty good performance, in other words, if they're in good, good shape, then you can radiate the whole brain, but then if you specifically focus on one area in particular of the brain, you can actually, uh, that has a tumor, you can even do better. Um, and this has been shown in a couple of different, uh, a couple of different modalities, but one of the concerns here is, well, whole brain radio, radiotherapy also is, can be a disadvantage uh, to patients because it can have cognitive issues. So what about just doing stereotactic radiosurgery to the lesion instead of doing whole brain radiosurgery? Um, and there's actually some, uh, uh, some level two evidence to suggest uh, that, um, that a single dose of stereotactic radio surgery may provide equivalent survival advantages to patients who got um, uh, 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 brain mass versus whole brain and single dose radiation. So that's nice. That means that what we can do is if we see a metastatic lesion, in the old days we used to just radiate the whole brain, and then we, got the, then we used to radiate the whole brain plus the lesion. Well, now what we're doing is we're just radiating the lesion these folks are doing about as well. So that's good. That means that also these patients have then less cognitive side effects. So stereotactic radio surgery really has been helpful. Um, surgical resection uh, versus whole brain versus uh, stereotactic radio surgery and whole brain. Well, um, both are effective and it really just depends on 
on the uh, individual patient. Uh, if there's a lot of mass effect, typically a surgical resection of whole brain is typically often what we'll do. Stereotactic radio surgery plus whole brain uh, is sometimes what we'll do as a salvage strategy. But I think the key thing here is that, um, oh, let me tell you, th this is not great evidence um, with regard to stereotactic radio surgery alone versus whole brain surgery alone. And this is really where the next kind of um, uh, frontier is because although we do have some preliminary data to suggest um, that a single dose uh, radio surgery uh, may be effective, level three evidence uh, typically is not something where we're going to change our treatment paradigm based upon. Um, so I guess my summary with regard to metastatic disease is a simple one. That it looks like radio surgery may be a useful adjunct uh, in, uh, in some cases and may be an effective treatment modality by itself instead of whole brain radio surgery. Um, there's obviously a lot more data that has to has to be done on that. Let's talk about a different type of brain tumor where sometimes we use stereotactic radio surgery. That's, that, those are meningiomas. Meningiomas are benign brain abnormalities or brain tumor uh, that, again, don't spread. They don't, cause, they don't cause problems until one or two things happens. They grow to be a certain size and actually start affecting the brain just because of their sheer presence. Or they start affecting the, the, the local nerve structures. They start pressing those nerves and causing problems. And so that's when that's what we're called to help deal with these. Most of these meningiomas are very slow growing, uh, and they have uh, a very low mitotic rate, which means that they're not as likely to be susceptible to radiation. The faster growing tumors who have a higher mitotic rate, because mitosis occurs when cells divide, um, are more likely to be affected. So one might argue, well, if they're slow growing and they've got a low mitotic rate, then how is radiation therapy even going to be effective? Because if they're not in that mitotic cycle, they're not, going to, they're not necessarily going to be affected by that. But indeed, um, uh, there have been uh, some studies that have shown that for st uh, stereotactic radio surgery, uh, a lower base, um, uh, or sorry, that we do get some excellent tumor control. Now, tumor control is a key operative word here because this doesn't mean that we're treating the tumor. This just means that we're uh, trying to control the tumor size, all right? So if the tumor's already so large that it's causing problems, this isn't probably going to be an effective strategy. Um, but a lot of these times, a complete resection isn't feasible because, um, uh, because oftentimes these tumors are already associated with vascular structures or neural structures that we don't want to lose. So typically, resection of the tumor and then radiation for the residual tumor is a real effective strategy uh, for treating tumors that otherwise couldn't be treated. Uh, or if we had tried to take the whole tumor out, it would have caused unacceptable neurologic side effects. Um, the goal here is long-term tumor growth prevention, in other words, stability of that tumor. Uh, indications against small to medium-sized tumors uh, or newly uh, or even recurring meningiomas. Control rates are pretty good for low-grade tumors, which a vast majority of these are. 93% control rate, that's great. That, that, that's, that's, that's virtually fixing the problem. For higher grade tumors um, of meningiomas, of which these are much less frequently seen, less than one or 2% of the time, we don't obviously have as good a control rate. Um, so this isn't as effective for higher grade meningiomas, but as a point of emphasis, those higher grade meningiomas are much less frequent. The dosing on these is, is pretty small. Remember in the, in the trigeminal neuralgia group, we were treating with 70 to 90 gray, really searing that nerve. Well, with these, we're treating with only 12 to 18 gray. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's a fairly small dose. Um, tumor shrinkage is nice because certainly that's a way of treatment, although, again, our goal here is actually the stability of the tumor itself. Um, and in patients who were symptomatic, at least half of these uh, will see some type of, uh, of improvement of their symptoms. Obviously, there are complications associated with any treatment, and, um, and so uh, we have to always weigh the pros and the cons regarding that. The um, uh, stereotactic radio surgery has been shown. Uh, this is probably the best study that we were able to find regarding this, and this is a uh, retrospective review of a large number of patients who have been in uh, And indeed, the key take home here is that the five to 10 year local control, global control rate uh, was about 90%, uh, and that's a very effective treatment strategy. Complications, sure they exist, but those are fairly modest if we're dealing with brain tumors. The other nice thing about stereotactic radio surgery is we're really able to, to uh, carefully uh, map out and create a plan where we can radiate tumors that are completely surgically in-resectable or non-resectable. Um, this is a, a cavernous sinus meningioma. Uh, 
uh, that has invaded the cavernous sinus and also obviously abutting this here, which is the brainstem. And we were able to carefully map this out uh, and identify the, the tumor itself, identify the critical structures such as the uh, brainstem here, uh, the optic nerve is running right above here, and we were able to uh, effectively treat that um, in a non-malignant fashion and provide some more control for this. Um, Optic nerve sheath uh, meningiomas, which are another non resectable type of tumor. Um, uh, normal orbit, normal optic nerve, normal eyeball, optic nerve filled with, filled with tumor. Well, this is obviously not a curable situation in any, in any way, but if we can get a low dose uh, to the tumor uh, and preserve the optic chiasm and the contralateral optic nerve, then we're going to have some success with treating this. Um, let me talk for the last uh, moment here about uh, high grade gliomas. High-grade gliomas are the kinds of tumors that will, that, that will kill a patient. And um, uh, much like metastatic disease, I guess I should say as well. But gliomas in particular, especially high-grade gliomas, uh, are indeed something that cause a great deal of morbidity. High-grade gliomas, uh, currently the standard of care is a surgical resection uh, plus chemotherapy plus radiation therapy. Um, and um, adding the stereotactic radiosurgery boost, if you will, before standard radiation therapy, which is typically a larger, a larger field, doesn't really provide a significant uh, survival benefit. Um, there may be, and there's actually uh, two studies that I know that are going on right now, there may be some survival benefit when stereotactic radiosurgery is done after radiation therapy. It's interesting, you wouldn't think that would indeed be the case. Um, so stereotactic radiosurgery, does have some limitations. Uh, it can control in, in the sense of gliomas, uh, well demarcated gliomas to some extent, but most gliomas are not super well demarcated. Uh, the majority of the uh, gliomas infiltrate the brain, which is different than metastases and different than angiomas. And as a result, this is probably why stereotactic brain surgery doesn't work as well for gliomas as it does for metastatic disease and for meningiomas. Um, it is probably a decent salvage option when all else has failed. Um, and so for the cases of recurrent gliomas, indeed, it's something that we can uh, indeed consider. So that's all I've got for you this morning. Any questions? Thank you.